Welcome everybody to Paleo Talks. We are now on episode 24 and we are here today with Dr. Joshua Samuels who is a faculty member in the Department of Geosciences at East Tennessee State University right here where we are at and he's also a curator out at the Gray Fossil Site and Museum. Uh, Josh has been with us for a few years now and is well known for working on a wide variety of different mammals and sometimes even reptiles and other critters. Um, today, in particular, he's going to talk about rodents and the weird, bizarre rodents uh, that are out there from the past, or at least a, a sampling of them. So uh, before I do a little bit more with the introduction, let's jump over to David and he can go over the show. Thanks, Blaine, and thanks everyone for tuning in again for Paleo Talks. Same format as you've been accustomed to if you've been following us uh, so far. We're going to have a presentation from our guest. There might be some chatter along the way, some friendly conversation. And then about part, uh, halfway through or so, the presentation, we are going to open it up to questions from the audience, at which point we will tell you that if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Facebook comments here on the Facebook video. And as usual, if for any reason you can't comment on our Facebook, you can go over to the Gray Fossil site, Twitter or Instagram pages and send us your questions there. And I'm gonna be keeping an eye on all of that uh, for our Q&A session, which will go until probably around one. All right, thank you, David. Uh, Dr. Christopher Widga is also here with us again today. And uh, so part of our conversation will, in will include Chris. And before we go any farther, just a reminder, we are coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology here at East Tennessee State University in Johnson City and also the Gray Fossil Site out at Gray. And it looks like Chris is actually out there right now today. So we do these paleo talks as a continuation of paleo conversation, uh, particularly while we are mostly working from home. And again, today we are lucky enough uh, very happy to have Dr. Joshua Samuels with us. And his topic again is looking at weirdo rodents from the past. And so Josh, if you wouldn't mind uh, going ahead and sharing your screen. And then what I want you to do, uh, we've had you on the show one other time, but this time I'd like you just to tell us a little bit more about your background, how you got into paleontology in the first place, and what led you to uh, ever studying rodents. Thanks for having me. Um, so my background, I'm originally from Idaho. I got my start, I, I was one of those kids who always wanted to be a paleontologist, but if you had asked me what I wanted to do, I wanted to study dinosaurs. But then I got to college and I learned there's a lot of other things out there, particularly things that um, not a lot of people study. And so one of the professors I had in undergrad, who's um, a mammologist named Eric Jensen, he introduced me to Greg McDonald, who was the paleontologist at Hagerman Fossil Beds there in Idaho, where I grew up. And that's where I got my start, was being an intern in uh, that national park site. And that was something that really helped me get my start and really is what got me started studying beavers. And it was just kind of convenience that they, one of the most abundant animals there were beavers and they hadn't really been studied a lot. Great, great. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of people think about paleontology and they think about these very uh, popular animals, but for the most part, most of us don't work on dinosaurs and saber-toothed cats. Uh, although actually all of us here at the Gray Fossil Site have worked a little bit with saber-toothed cats. The, the road that we end up taking is often, you know, one of our first experiences or some of our first experiences in paleontology. And uh, rodents are such an important group. And, you know, they make up, what, over a third or almost a third of mammals today? Yeah, more than a third. Well, if you'll just go ahead and start working through your presentation, I'll, I'll throw in some questions here and there. All right, so what I'm gonna be talking to you about are a variety of different kinds of weird rodents from the past. And really a lot of my research is focused on paleoecology, studying how extinct animals live. And I got started studying rodents because there were lots of fossils of them, but people hadn't studied their ecology a lot. And 
part of what I'm going to start out with is just kind of an introduction to rodents and the sorts of things they do today, the kinds of ecology lifestyles that they have, and the diversity that they have in terms of species and, and different lifestyles is something that makes them a really interesting group to study. What I'm showing you here on the screen to start with, I've got that big thing looking head on at you. That is a skeleton of a giant beaver, one of the things I'll be talking about today. They were something that I'll talk more about, but they lived all over North America and they got to be about eight feet long. And this is a skeleton that you can see at the Field Museum. There on the, the right, there's a skull of a horned gopher. And yes, there were rodents with horns. And um, down below that is a, a skeleton of what's called a burrowing beaver. So these are just some of the things I'll be talking about. So rodents are arguably the most successful group of mammals. They are more than 2,000 species and they live just about everywhere on earth in a terrestrial environment, on land. And um, they include things like beavers, gophers, squirrels, guinea pigs, porcupines, rats, mice, lots of very familiar organisms. And there are a lot of them that have very diverse lifestyles. And so on the screen here, you can see um, things like squirrels and chipmunks and mice, but there's also capybaras. And one of the first things people think about with rodents is the fact that they are opportunists. They, um, a lot of them will eat just about anything they can find. And so everybody knows things like pizza rat or have seen things like squirrels stealing from bird feeders. And a lot of rodents will do this. They will just take advantage of whatever kind of food source is available. And part of the, um, adaptations that rodents have are these incisors and their, their jaw muscles that are very distinctive. And part of that lets them exploit all kinds of food resources, things that a lot of other animals couldn't. Josh, could you mention what you mean by successful? Because I think a lot of people probably giggle when they hear as something <laughs> like rodents being the most successful, but from a biological point of view. So in, in terms of the numbers of them, there's incredible numbers, very large populations, and they live just about everywhere on earth where you're going to find a mammal. So you can find them from beaches at sea level all the way up to mountaintops. And there's some that were recently studied in the Andes in South America. The highest living mammal is a kind of mouse that lives there. Um, and you can find them out in the driest, harshest deserts, things like this, um, Jerboa, shown here in the middle of the screen, lives in places where you aren't going to find a lot of other animals. And so anywhere on land, you can usually find rodents and you can find a lot of them. And they have a lot of lifestyles that other groups don't. So things like beavers eating wood, um, a lot of things that are burrowing and living underground, that's not the kind of lifestyle you see in a lot of the other groups of organisms. Thank you. So while we think of rodents as being opportunists, usually there are a lot of them that are very specialized. So in the top left, there's a grasshopper mouse you may have heard of. They feed on um, both invertebrates and vertebrates. So they'll eat things like the scorpions or various kinds of insects, but they'll also feed on other rodents or shrews. Uh, in the upper right, there's the um, Australian water rat, and it's actually one of several different kinds of fishing rats. There's a, a variety of different groups that have independently evolved a kind of otter-like fishing lifestyle. Um, things like beavers feed on wood. Not a lot of other animals are able to do that. In the middle, that's a um, tuco tuco that's digging underground. Um, and then you've got a um, prairie dog inhabiting the kind of Great Plains. So there's lots of these things that are feeding on things like grass, seeds, um, wood, lots of different kinds of resources. And the way they do this is because they have these special incisors, the buck teeth that everybody thinks of when they think of rodents. And the incisors are very special because they have the hard enamel that covers our own teeth on the front of them, but most of the tooth isn't covered in enamel and it ends up creating a self-sharpening blade. You've got the softer dentine behind it and it makes it so they have these teeth that are really great for chewing on all kinds of things. Um, 
Rodents are known to do things like chew through walls of houses or concrete or chop down trees like these beavers, and these teeth allow them to do that. And rodents also have really diverse kinds of locomotion. They get around in a lot of different ways. So there are things like beavers, again, that are semi-aquatic. They spend a lot of time in the water. They are among the most uh, capable divers in among mammals. There are also things like kangaroo rats and jerboas. There are these bipedal jumping animals. There's lots of climbing animals like squirrels and porcupines. There's burrowers, including a wide range of burrowers that really spend most of their life underground, like these naked mole rats. And then gliding animals like flying squirrels, but also um, several other families of rodents are known to have gliding members. So the kinds of things I do, the research methods I have are what would be called ecomorphology. And a lot of what I do is I look at the anatomy of living organisms and how it relates to their ecology. And then I use that to infer the lifestyle of extinct species. So I've done this with rodents, I've done it with carnivores, but a lot of the things I'm doing are taking linear measurements or taking, um, doing landmark analyses. And this sort of things can allow us to look at the shape, the uh, structure of the body and compare it among groups that have different sorts of lifestyles. So the first rodent I wanted to mention is something that's not so weird. When you think about something like squirrels, they should be familiar to pretty much everybody in the audience. But there's a very weird thing about squirrels. And the fact is that they are living fossils. There are skeletons of squirrels, if you go back 30 million years ago, that look pretty much identical to living tree squirrels. So here on the screen, you can see a skeleton of a squirrel that I described with Bill Korth a few years ago. And this squirrel, Protosiris, it is almost identical to squirrels today despite the fact that this skeleton is about 27 million years old. Um, and as opposed to a lot of other groups of animals, rather than changing as environments have changed over time, squirrels have just followed the habitats they like. Being a squirrel is a um, very successful lifestyle. It's something where squirrels can inhabit lots of different places. As long as there's trees and some sort of food sources, they, they tend to be happy. Now, on to the really weird things. So the, fir the first of these is this giant beaver, Castoroides. And go ahead and interrupt if you have any questions. I was going to say, Josh, if you wouldn't mind just commenting on a moment here, the importance of modern comparative collections in the work that you do. You know, what could you really say about these past lives of these animals if you didn't have a really good modern comparative collection? Yeah, and so one thing I'll mention is, you know, I, I point out these different sorts of measurements that I do, and a lot of my work is really spending time in modern skeletal collections and going through and measuring lots of skeletons of modern species and trying to get a good grasp on how these lifestyles relate to anatomy. And without good collections, I wouldn't be able to do this sort of thing. So it's something where um, going to museums all over the country is what's really allowed me to do the work I do and studying those collections. And quite often those are collections that have been built by a lot of hard work over a long time is really important for everything I do. Exactly, and a lot of people don't realize that importance that these modern collections play in our paleontological interpretations. Thank you. Yeah, and, and something like this giant beaver, I can't just study it in isolation. If I just look at this bizarre eight foot long skeleton, it's the kind of thing that um, it, it looks very strange. It's got a lot of distinctive anatomical features, really understanding what a lot of modern relatives of this look like is key to understanding how this thing lived. And these giant beavers, they were around from about 2 million years ago until the end of the Pleistocene, about 12,000 years ago. And this skeleton at the Field Museum is nearly eight feet long. There's another one uh, that's at Earlham College. It's even a little bit bigger. And these things um, probably weighed about 200 pounds, so getting, getting up to 100 kilograms. So they are a very large rodent, bigger than um, anything that's alive today. One of the, you know, I've, I've given a lot of talks on Pleistocene animals, and you talk about mammoths, mastodons, giant bears, camels, all of these animals that used to be here in North America. But when I mention 
giant beavers the size of black bears that turns people's head i think more than any of the other animals have you had a similar kind of experience with that yeah i mean that's the the thing about these that charismatic fauna that was around in the Pleistocene, people think of a lot of these other animals, but they're quite often not familiar with something like this. And these rather large rodents that were around in the past are something that immediately catches people's interest. And the, the skull that's shown there, um, that's more than a foot long. So it's, it's a, this is a very large animal. <laughs> And there's a lot of anatomical features of castoroides that say it was aquatic. When you look at this thing head on, you can see the eye sockets here are on top of the head and the, um, the ears are actually elevated, the nasal bones, the nose are elevated. All of these sense organs kind of being on top of the head means they can function when this animal's in the water. And if you think about the way people see beavers most often, it's they're sitting in the water and they're looking up out of it. They're kind of just floating with the top of their head sticking out of the water. And the skull anatomy reflects that sort of behavior. Um, they also have a somewhat flat tail. It's more like a muskrat than living beaver. So it's not the big broad paddle that you would see in Castor today. Um, it, it was narrower. And there's a lot of features in the legs that are something that were characteristic of animals that do this kind of hind limb paddling. So here you can see the femur, the thigh bone of uh, a beaver today and a capybara, and here's castoroides. And the skull length of something like a capybara may be pretty close to something like castoroides, but when you look at this, the lifestyles of these animals are very, very different. Capybaras are more kind of like, um, a sheep or a goat, they spend a lot of their time on the surface and then they kind of dog paddle with all fours when they go in the water. Um, this is an animal that is using its hind feet to paddle and it's got all these big muscle attachments on its thigh bone that um, indicate that kind of lifestyle. And so some of the things I've done have been looking at and doing these kind of statistical analyses with big samples of different kinds of rodents and looking at some of these things. And what you can see here, all of these things in blue, these are various kinds of fossil beavers related to the, basically here's the modern beavers uh, ancestor here in North America, and all of these different fossil members of the giant beaver lineage. And the analysis I did said statistically that these things are semi-aquatic and that they were probably hind limb paddlers like living beavers and muskrats and those water rats I showed before. And not only are they having that kind of lifestyle, but they're actually more specialized for aquatic life than any living rodent. Their hind foot is actually more than a foot long in that skeleton I just showed you. This is something where if you have ever seen a beaver walking around on land, they're really awkward. They, they always go to water for refuge. They're um, kind of rather clumsy looking on land. And castoroides, it probably would have been even more clumsy. So when people start thinking about these things going extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, when humans are showing up, I imagine this was an animal that probably, apart from going in the water, wasn't very able to defend itself. It was um, something that would have been kind of slow and awkward on land. And looking at the shape of its skull, it also has a skull that has really deep um, basically the, the snout is really deep and robust. It's got big muscle attachments and the structure of the teeth are all features that reflect it being some kind of specialist herbivore, meaning it was probably eating a lot of uh, tough plants or some kind of abrasive material. And the fact that it's got these big, broad, curved incisors means it would be probably very good at grazing. When you look at something like a capybara today, it's eating a lot of aquatic vegetation and, um, vegetation growing on the margins of um, various aquatic environments. And it basically uses those big broad incisors for cropping vegetation. And there's actually just some recent isotope work that's been done by Plint et al. And here's a picture from a, one of their recent news stories with a um, model of a giant beaver. But they looked at comparing modern beavers and this fossil giant beaver 
and things like muskrats, and they looked at the isotope composition of their teeth and compared it to different kinds of plants. And there's good evidence here that they were probably feeding on more submerged plants than living beavers and not really any evidence of them feeding on trees, vegetation um, that's outside of the water as much. And I have to mention, a lot of people don't know that there were actually other giant beavers. So one of them is this thing called Trogontherium. This is an independently evolved giant beaver that was in Europe and Asia at the same time. The last record of these is from China and dated to about 40,000 years ago. So they survived longer in North America, but the um, Eurasian continent was inhabited by humans much earlier. So that, that may be something that's linked to the earlier extinction of giant beavers on that continent. So is the, the chewing of these giant trees and you know, building these big dams something that's unique to the living beaver then? So the, there have been people who have looked at the evolution of woodcutting and the woodcutting was definitely done by, I can show you right here, this thing Dipoides, which is an earlier member of the giant beaver lineage. It's known from a site up in the high Arctic of Canada, um, that genus Dipoides. And there's a bunch of cut wood there that has cut marks consistent with the incisors of this beaver. Um, we know that Dipoides was definitely cutting wood. We know the living beaver Castor cuts wood. Whether or not Castoroides did, um, there's, there's not good evidence of it cutting wood or building dams. So at this point, we, we can't be sure, but we know some of its ancestors were. But what we can say is that these incisors, they are round and very broad. That's not really a shape that's very effective for doing something like cutting wood. When you look at a, a beaver today, its teeth have this very flat, sharp face that is kind of like a chisel and they're really well suited for chopping down trees. But that wasn't the case for castoroides. The teeth would suggest it probably wasn't chopping down trees much. It probably could have eaten branches or eaten um, leaves off of trees, but chopping them down and building dams, we just don't really have evidence for. Thank you. All right. So sticking with beavers, I want to mention there's also an extinct lineage of burrowing beavers. And they were in North America from about 30 million years ago to 18 million years ago. And they're interesting because they were the first group of rodents to be highly specialized for life underground. This thing, Paleocaster, is really common in Oligocene and Miocene sites in North America. And it's found in places like agate fossil beds associated with these very odd burrows. And some of them get to be 10 feet deep and they've got this odd spiral shape to them. So you can see it here going down from the surface in this spiral shape. And the skeletons of these beavers have been found within. So this is actually one that was found in a Diaminelix. Um, and the idea of these is that potentially these are things where they're using this for refuge. It might have been some sort of climate adaptation that's been suggested by some people. Um, you have different kind of airflow from these um, deep burrows with a kind of helical shape than you would a straight tunnel. But the walls of the burrows have scratch and tooth marks. So we know these things were um, the ones that actually made the burrows. And in some of those analyses where I've looked at things like skull shape and the, the morphology of the limbs, um, there's some features that tell us that things like Paleocaster, this was has a skull shape that looks like some things like gophers today that dig with their teeth um, or those naked mole rats. And there are other burrowing beavers though that have teeth or have a skull structure that looks like some things called headlift burrowing rodents today. And that includes things like this blind mole rat. And these blind mole rats live in Asia and they are effectively blind. They have um, this odd little um, rough spot on their nose that's kind of a horny pad that they use to push on the dirt and they use their head kind of like a bulldozer. And they've got this distinctive flattened and slanted back of the head. And various groups of extinct beavers have this. This group called Euhapsus include some things that were, in terms of their skull shape, very much like these blind mole rats. And the 
optic canal where the optic nerve going to the eye uh, exits the skull is highly reduced. It's almost effectively gone in these things. So they may have been blind and spent their whole life underground just feeding on roots. So burrowing rodents changed a lot over time. Different groups have filled that role. And after those burrowing beavers went extinct, another group that kind of rose and took their place were horned gophers, what are called myelogolids. And um, there's only one of them that's actually known to have horns and that's Ceratogallus. And it was in North America from about 16 to 5 million years ago. And like rhinos, um, the, the horn here, you have this kind of bony um, and rough surface that you probably had a, a horny pad sitting on. So kind of like when you, you think about things like rhinos or bovids, they'll have something on top of, you might have a, a protuberance on the nose, but there's a carrot and sheath covering it. And that probably was the case for these. So Josh, you know, without being too technical, what makes a beaver a beaver then? Um, when you think about, when we think about beavers, you know, we think of the water aspect of the beaver, but morphologically, what makes it a beaver? So there's certain characteristics of the tooth shape and structure, and um, also the jaw muscles are very distinctive in beavers. So there's some, some pretty easy ways to tell a beaver. And really, um, the, if I look at the pattern of the holes in the skulls here, where all the different nerves and blood vessels exit, or if I look at the patterns in the teeth, these things, they still look like a beaver, but there's some features of their anatomy that are very much convergent with a lot of other rodents that do different kinds of lifestyles today, rather than the aquatic beavers we all think of. Okay. And so these horned gophers are interesting, and um, they're really the only rodent that's known to have had horns. And we, uh, Jonathan Khalid and I recently described a new species of this Ceratogallus, and we built a new phylogeny of them. And here you can see this is the kind of family tree and everything here that's within this genus Ceratogallus has some sort of horns. Um, but an interesting thing about them is these, these horns are, are rather distinctive. They're, they're rather clear. Um, Samantha Hopkins had done some work uh, a number of years ago where she was looking at trying to understand what the function of these was. And looked at, could they be used for digging? Could they be used for something like display? Um, or might they, they have been used for defense? And the orientation of them, the shape of them, the shape of other aspects of the anatomy really makes it so the only good explanation for them is that they're being used for defense. And if you think about something like a, a prairie dog or a marmot and they, uh, a groundhog, and they stick their head out of their burrow like this, having the horns be the first thing that comes out of the hole might help deter some predator that was there. If you think about a predator near that entrance to the burrow, having some horns be the first thing that comes out might help deter predators. And what we found is we looked at the size of the horns, and this is basically the length of the tooth row, and here's the height of the horn cores. And what we found is that the horns increased in size over time, and they also got bigger and larger species. And the time that these things were evolving is also a time when things like badgers, skunks, and some kinds of hawks actually showed up in North America. And so these new predators may have been driving this defensive adaptation in these horned gophers. All right, and the last weird rodent I'm gonna mention is the giant flying squirrels. And flying squirrels, we have them living here in Tennessee and all over North America today. But the flying squirrels we have are one called Glaucomies and it's fairly small but there are actually multiple species of giant flying squirrels living in Asia, this thing called pederista. And in the past, there were giant flying squirrels living much more broadly. There was one described just a couple of years ago from Spain that is most of a skeleton. So we really do know that this is something that was a, um, a gliding animal and it had an anatomy almost identical to these living giant flying squirrels. And they're known from 
all over Europe and Asia. And there's actually two records of them in North America. And so there's one from Florida that was named Myopederista webi. And um, we found one tooth here at the Gray Fossil Site that's um, incredibly similar. It seems to be the same sort of thing. And what this means is that these giant flying squirrels were living across the whole Northern Hemisphere in the Miocene and the um, early Pliocene, and maybe surviving even into the Pleistocene. So some of these things that would seem very strange, a uh, animal that kind of is the size of a house cat and looks more like a kite when it's gliding is something that actually lived here in the past. So Josh, can you give us a feel for you know, what size are we talking about here with an animal that we're, everybody might be familiar with? So the, the size of this animal, this pederista, it is about as big as a house cat, but then it's got um, this, these very long legs and this membrane that's spread between the arms and the legs. And so, um, I mean, it would have only weighed a few pounds. It's very lightly built, but thinking of something like a house cat, that's about the size it was. Okay. All right. And so, um, I want to acknowledge a few people who I've worked with on rodents and also my wife, Keila, who did illustrations for some of these things in the past. And um, like Blaine mentioned before, there are a lot of museums I visited to look at both fossils and modern animals. And there's been a lot of people who have helped me study those over the years. And the last one I'm going to show you here, this is a giant marmot. So marmots or groundhogs, we uh, are, most of us are familiar with here. There's a holiday for them. But there was also one that was much larger in the past. And this thing, Pini Marmota, it is uh, an animal that was probably pushing uh, 60, 70 pounds. So this is a very large ground squirrel. And it's really, this specimen is the um, largest squirrel that anyone's ever found. It's something that's at Hagerman Fossil Beds. And um, one of those back burner projects that I'm going to try to wrap up describing it. But um, it's also got anatomy, it's most of a skeleton, its anatomy suggests that it was a digging animal too. And so it's um, a really large animal to be doing much digging. And um, it's just a, a very odd thing to find. And really there's a lot more things probably like this out there that um, are just waiting to be found. All right. Well, thank you, Josh. The you know, I love, I love learning about rodents and, and microfauna and the power of microfauna and what you can learn about that. And the gray fossil site itself, you know, for quite some time, we haven't looked in great detail at the microfauna. We, we spent many years digging, we screen wash everything. And, and when you got here, you sort of had a lot of materials that you were able to start looking at as a rodent uh, expert. And, you know, so just if you if you comment for a minute just on that that sort of power of the microfauna itself and how important that is and actually telling us more about paleontology. Well, one thing I like to point out about a lot of these animals. So I, I showed you all those rodents at the beginning. A lot of these rodents are relatively small and they have very specific lifestyles and very specific environments they inhabit. So something like beavers, they may live all over the continent. But if you think about a lot of these other animals, things like mice, chipmunks, ground squirrels, if you go different places here in the country, you're gonna find different animals. And so they are very specific to the environments they're living in. Quite often they reflect those environments. And since they're small, they also evolve very quickly. So if you think about something like mice, some of them, some, some species of mice can actually give birth several weeks after their own birth. So they can be reproductively active just in a few weeks after being born. And that means you can go through generations of them in a year and they can evolve and respond very quickly. And as a result, when you get changes in the environment or um, these kinds of perturbations in the environment that we think about, like climate change or um, some kind of new predators arriving, those sorts of things, these rodents respond really quickly. And so the fossils that we get from something like screen washing can tell us a lot about local environments, how they change over time, and um, just larger body size things. A lot of times they 
they live in wide areas and so they they don't give you that habitat specificity and the rate of evolution itself can give us an idea of the age of the fossil site and and so that's something else you've worked with with gray is, is helping to narrow down the age based on the microfauna yeah since a lot of these things change relatively quickly they only were around for a short period of time and so the things that we find can be a good indicator of a particular time period. All right. Well, David, if you want to bring in any questions we have from the Facebook audience, we also have some I see uh, from the Zoom chat group, but let's start with Facebook. Sure thing. Yeah, we've got a whole bunch of questions that have come in on Facebook. As a reminder to everyone watching, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Facebook comments or head to our other social media, Gray Fossil Site on Twitter or Instagram to ask your questions. We've got a whole list. Uh, Josh, I'm gonna start with a very simple personal question for you from Donna. What got you interested in rodents? So what got me interested in rodents is the fact that I wanted to study something where there were lots of fossils and living animals so I could have lots of fossils to study and try to figure out what they were doing, but it was something that was alive and closely or closely related to things alive today. And rodents were a really convenient group to that. There have been a lot of people who studied fossil rodents, but there weren't all that many people who were trying to figure out the lifestyles of extinct rodents. And so it was a really convenient thing for me. It was a really good group to study. And once I started studying them, I found there's so much diversity. It was something that's just continually interesting. Very cool. They're a really fascinating group uh, to look at. Uh, Grant asks, is the gray fossil site flying squirrel bigger than the giant flying squirrels of Southeast Asia? It's, it's the same size as some of the species. So it's probably not as big as the, it, it's not as big as the largest of them, but that, that genus Pederista that includes a bunch of species of giant flying squirrels, um, it falls within that size range. Gotcha. And then another flying squirrel question. Uh, Donna asks, how far back can we trace the morphology of flying squirrels? And are there any DNA links to ancient rodents? So in terms of flying squirrels, it's really hard to tell what was actually a flying squirrel in the fossil record. You need very specific parts of the anatomy to tell you that the animal was actually gliding. Mostly when we're talking about the fossil record, the, the things that show up most often are things like teeth. But the problem with a lot of rodents is the teeth don't tell you when you're talking about the, the teeth in your cheeks, it doesn't tell you about how that animal was moving. So it might have just had teeth that look like a flying squirrel, but may have just been a climber. So there are things that have teeth that look like flying squirrels today that go back probably about 25 million years. But in terms of actual skeletons with anatomy that we can say, yes, this was 100% a glider. The earliest we have is that one from Spain that's from kind of the middle of Miocene. I think it's about 12 million years old. Gosh, and, the, uh, yeah. if we look at the giant beaver, they have these crenulations on the incisors. And Greg McDonald brings this up as a question to you about the functionality of those crenulations. What are they for? I'm not certain, but there's a variety of larger rodents that have those crenulations. So the... Um, the giant marmot there actually has similar sorts of this kind of corrugated pattern, this zigzag pattern in the enamel. Um, the best idea I have is from talking to a few other people that they suggested it might be for stopping cracks. So if you have them biting on something, that kind of zigzag texture to it can keep the crack from propagating through the whole tooth. And so it's if they bite something hard and it cracks a little bit, it runs into a zigzag and, and stops. Uh, hey, let's, uh, Chris, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I, I got a question for you, Josh. Um, you know, you, you see this, this kind of oversized rodents occurring in multiple lineages. Is there any sort of common thread that says, oh, okay, uh, you know, we have a, a giant rodent is going to fill an ecological niche because of this? Uh, I, I mean, is there any commonality between these different things or any feeling on that? A lot of the ones that are the, the biggest members of the groups actually are things that are aquatic. So taking up an aquatic lifestyle gives you some refuge. If you think about what's the limit on the size of a lot of these things, it's 
being seen by predators. So you can climb a tree, you can dig underground, you can go to water, that's how you get away. The ones that are the biggest are things like these, these beavers. There's some rodents in South America that are somewhat related to capybaras and may have had similar lifestyles. It may have been that they were taking up some of this kind of aquatic, large aquatic rodent niche. And some of the ones in South America were much bigger than castor oil. is maybe even getting up to a thousand pounds. So Josepho artigasia and telecomies are two from South America that were just gigantic. That's cool. <laughs> so Josh, speaking of our microfauna and rodents at Gray, and, and comparing that, because I know you have to some extent, comparing that to other microfauna, particularly the rodents from other sites across North America that are about the same age, maybe talk just a moment about the uniqueness of gray and what it represents. The unique thing about gray, I'd say, is that at that time, you start seeing a lot of voles coming in and voles and muskrats and their relatives come into North America a little bit more than 5 million years ago and they just take off and they become really diverse. And then most sites where you've got rodents, it's those things. And it's just huge numbers of those things. They're the, the most abundant things that tons of fossil sites from that time period. We don't have any at gray. And I think it's partly because it's reflecting a different sort of environment. Voles, um, they like cold conditions in some cases, they, they do pretty well in arid conditions and the evidence we have for gray is that it wasn't like that. And so a lot of what we have, we've got a lot of things that look like climbers and that's really rare for that time period. So we've got multiple species of tree squirrels, multiple species of flying squirrels. And we've also got a um, thing called a birch mouse and those are alive in uh, Asia today. And they're a climbing adapted kind of mice. They, they have a prehensile tail. So the fact that we've got five rodents is the site that I can say, these are all climbing animals. No other sites from the time period have that. So oh, would most voles at that time be living more in a grazing grass <clears throat> prairie type of environment maybe? Probably, yeah. So things like prairie steppes, grasslands are probably what they were most adapted for at that time. Great. That question uh, uh, sort of leads into this other question that we've gotten from Mason who asks, are there places and time periods which are rodent evolution gray areas that you'd really like to learn more about? Well, one thing that's interesting is that there's, um, you know, the, the gray fossil site is one of the things that's actually filling in some of that. There's a lot of the Western part of North America. So in the Pacific Northwest, in the Great Basin, in the Great Plains, where you have lots of fossil sites with lots of rodents. That's not the case for the eastern part of North America. So there's a lot of these gaps about where did things out here come from? What are they related to? You know, some of the things we we're already finding is, I mentioned that birch mouse, this giant flying squirrel, those are things that live in Asia. And we have Asian connections between our rodents at Gray and not that many connections to things that are living out in the western part of this continent. So that's an interesting thing to start thinking about and reconstructing how animals move from one place to another in the past. All right, we've got a couple of, so I'm gonna combine two questions for this next one, which are interesting. Uh, Charlie asks, are there any uh, mustelids known to co-evolve with or prey on the large species of beavers? And a similar uh, question from one of our students here, Christiane asked, is there any evidence of humans hunting the large beavers? I'm not aware of any evidence of humans hunting the large beavers. I, I know they would certainly be an attractive target just because um, we, we have good evidence that they were aquatic. Going back much further in the fossil record, we can find they've got this grooming claw in Castoroides and their ancestors that was used to spread this oil over their fur that helps keep them from um, getting, it keeps their fur dry basically when they go in water. Um, they would be an attractive target because their coats would have been so um, kind of probably dense and, and good for insulation, but we don't have any evidence that, that I know of of them being hunted by humans. Um, as far as members of the weasel family, um, 
sometimes otters will go into lodges and eat beavers today. The, they're not the top predators. Actually, the things that are the top predators are bears and wolves are more commonly predators of beavers. And bears will sometimes smash open lodges and wolves will get the beavers when they're out on land trying to do things like chop down trees. Um, the mustelids though, members of the weasel family, the ones that have a, they've evolved with quite often are a lot of these burrowing rodents. So there's pretty good evidence that the shape and body structure of things like ferrets and badgers are really an adaptation to going underground and getting things like brown squirrels and the, the burrowing rodents that are living in those habitats. Very cool. Those are fun questions to think about. Uh, hey, Blaine, did you have any questions you wanted to bring in? Let, let's go ahead and bring in some of the other student questions, David. Okay, sure. Uh, actually, I've got another pair of questions that are related here. Um, ben on Facebook asked, is it possible to tell if, it, if an extinct rodent built dams? And one of our students, Kelly, asked, uh, have you found that there are any climate or environmental pressures that could have led to, uh, oh, these aren't related. I thought they were related. I'm sorry. Well, let's answer Ben's, uh, Ben's question first. Is it possible to tell if an extinct rodent uh, built dams? So the only evidence we have of dam building comes from actual artifacts. So fossil wood that's been cut and then um, kind of accumulated together. So there's a site in the Arctic on Ellesmere Island in Canada that is called the Beaver Dam Site. And it's actually about the same age as the Great Fossil Site. So probably four to four and a half million years old. And they've got a beaver there, Dipoides, which is considered an ancestor of these giant beavers. And there's lots of wood cut by them there and um, lots of accumulation of, it's called the Beaver Dam Site because it basically looks like there's a beaver dam there. So as far as fossil evidence, that's the only evidence we have um, right now. But based upon the relationships of these organisms, we can infer that more than 10 million years ago, there were probably um, beavers that were doing dam building. We know that Castor and Dipoides were both doing it, and both of those go back at least 10 million years, just those, those genera. So even from, if it was only them doing it, probably 10 million years ago, there were dams all over the Northern Hemisphere. Very cool to think about. Uh, and now I'll go ahead and ask uh, Kelly's question since I started it. Uh, Kelly asked, have you found that there were any particular climate or environmental pressures that could have led to burrowing in beavers? Yeah, so the, the time period that burrowing beavers show up is right around 30 million years ago. And that's just shortly after um, the shift that's associated with the Eocene Oligocene transition. At that time period, you have Antarctica break off and become isolated and we start to get our first um, southern ice cap at that time period during the Cenozoic. The Himalayas were also rising up. And so at that time period, right around between 30 and 33 million years ago, global temperatures basically drop dramatically and conditions get more arid. And so these beavers are showing up right at the time period where environments start to get cooler, drier, and we have evidence of them getting more open. So ancient soil evidence suggests you, you had a shift to these kind of open woodland environments in some places at that time. And that's when these burrowing beavers show up. Let's see, we have one from Julian. Have we asked that one yet? I didn't think so. Uh, Julian's question is about uh, paleocaster appears to plot with semi-fossorial rodents. Is this consistent with its paleoecology in the fossil record? So in the two different kinds of analyses I've done, I've done things where I looked at the limbs and I've looked at the skull. And the anatomy of these things in different parts of their body can kind of be a mosaic. So in the case of paleocaster, its limbs look a lot like what are called semi-fossorial rodents today, things that don't really spend all their time underground. They come to the surface and forage. So if you think about something like prairie dog or a ground squirrel or a groundhog, they all dig a burrow for refuge and they come to the surface to forage. That's what the limbs of paleocaster look like. But its skull and its teeth are more specialized for digging, like actually digging with the teeth. Um, 
than any of those things. So it probably didn't dig more extensively than those did. I mean, the, the burrows it makes are definitely larger than you would see in any of those living groups, but it almost certainly foraged at the surface, not eating roots underground. Whereas that weird blind euhapsis, maybe it was like the blind mole rats and just spent its time underground, not coming to the surface, feeding on roots and just living in the soil. So the burrowing rodents are just, to me, so fascinating in the fossil record because we, we have to stop and think and remember that they are actually burrowing down into older sediments, sometimes much, much older sediments that have other fossils in them. And in that process, they are displacing older fossils. And many times those older fossil deposits are old, you know, depositional environments that were lakes or uh, you know, different types of depositional systems where on the other hand, the rodents themselves are living probably in an environment that's more of a erosive surface. And then they're digging down, burrowing into it. And we get these burrows preserved because sometimes they are more resistant to weathering and erosion than the sediment that surrounds them. And one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, to what degree or to what extent are these burrows also useful for recording the animals that also fell into the burrow outside the burrowing animal itself? I have found in some of these same kinds of sites, I've found places where there are odd inclusions. So in, in Idaho, I've been to a site where it was Pliocene mammals. So it's things like horses and beavers and muskrats and things were the, what we were finding there. But we also found a Cretaceous clam. So a clam that's like a, a marine clam that just somehow got mixed in from, it was probably these things were digging into gravels that had, had been older sorts of things. But I'm not aware of how often that sort of thing happens. What I can say is that a lot of these burrows, we do find other animals in them that have occupied them. So those burrowing beaver, um, the, the, the spiral burrows that they have, there are some of their predators. There's one called Oligobunus that's this odd kind of badger-like mustela that has been found in those burrows um, and, and may have been hunting the beavers or you know, stealing their lodges or their, their burrows after they died. Yeah, I think I would think that snakes and even lizards might end up in there as well. Mm -hmm. Other questions we have, David or Chris? Yeah, we've got a few more from the Facebook crowd. Um, Gino asks, why did the horned gophers go extinct at the, at the place, Pliocene? So the time period where they were living through the middle and late Miocene is a time period where environments were changing a lot. And particularly when you get to the end of the Miocene, right at the Miocene-Pliocene transition, environments change a lot and grasslands spread pretty widely in North America. And so the, the best explanation is probably that they were um, exacerbated, their, their condition was perturbed by those climate changes that were going on at the time. There were also some new different kinds of um, organisms at the time. So like those, those different predators that I mentioned before, things like skunks and badgers and kinds of hawks all diversified at their time. So those horns may have been a, a decent defense, but there were a lot more new predators showing up and it, they, they may not have been able to keep up with all of that. Gotcha. We've got a question from Wes. Uh, this is an interesting question I haven't thought about. Who asked, is there any way to tell how big the litters were in the animals you've talked about? Um, in some cases, there are people who have looked at kind of adaptive strategies and looked at the kind of the size of the animals, but also how that relates to their growth rates and litter size. So people have tried to estimate that for some of these extinct rodents, but um, I'm not aware of any really good methods for being able to tell how many offspring they had. We could say that some of them were probably having lots of offspring and evolving quickly, um, whereas others were a little bit slower, but I'm not aware of ways to tell how many offspring they had. Do you ever find, uh, uh, how common is it to find like family groups of rodents, like a den with a bunch of babies in it? Um, I have not seen 
any of those. It, it's one of those things where I have, the only time I found what was probably a den was actually from a site in Oregon where I found what was um, probably a mouse deer den. And we had an, an adult and then multiple juvenile skeletons that were all found within like a one meter spot. So perhaps they were all living together in some small area. But um, in terms of my own experience, I, I haven't found any and I haven't seen them in museum collections where you probably had a, a large number. Um, I found things where it was probably a burrow and there was the skeleton of a rodent and also what was some of their food, so seeds that were accumulated in the burrow, but not, um, not the young ones. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Grant asks, how much work has been done with mylagolid isotope ecology, toothware, etc.? Um, as far as I know, none. All right. <laughs> and that's the case for a lot of these groups of organisms. It's just you know that I showed you from twenty nineteen. That was the you know some of the first giant beaver isotope work. There was one study that was went back. Um, to 1995, but there just hasn't been a lot of work on them compared to a lot of other groups. Just something where there, there is more potential for study. All right, something for, for people to look into. Grant's always looking for isotope work to do, it seems. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple others uh, to wrap up. Uh, going back to the flying squirrel discussion, Aaron, uh, one of our former uh, students, asks, uh, is uh, Grant's another former student as well, Aaron asks, is Pederistodon not a flying squirrel? Pederistodon has, it, it's probably related to all of the flying squirrels. So it is something that's grouped with them quite often. But since we don't have a skeleton, we don't know whether or not it was actually flying. So I've, I've described specimens of Pederistodon from Oregon that were about 25 million years old. The problem is if we just have teeth, we can't definitively say it was a glider and not just a tree squirrel that's kind of on the ancestral line going to flying squirrels. So it, it's quite often to tell or difficult to tell when did they actually take up that gliding lifestyle without the skeleton. Josh, I have one that's just a fun question and that is what is the largest rodent we've ever discovered? So the largest rodent that's ever been discovered is one from South America called Josepho artigasia. Hmm. And um, if I'm remembering right, I think its skull is about a foot and a half long and the body mass estimates are, are definitely putting it over a uh, thousand pounds. So it is, it was compared to the size of something like a bison. And it so, lived in trees, right? It, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I mean, the thing to think about is it, it's related to things like um, there's a it's a thing called dynamies today. But it, if you kind of think about the 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 group of rodents living in South America, just think about a a giant guinea pig, really a guinea pig the size of a bison is kind of uh, the the thing to think about. And did you say what age it is? Um, I believe it's Pliocene as well. Wow. It was, yeah, just a few million years old. I think it was three or four million years old. So the same time as some Australopithecus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, something to think about. And really, when you think about human evolution, there were giant rodents in a lot of the places that humans moved to. So in Europe and Asia, there were those giant beavers, and in North America, there were giant beavers. So, um, And what about capybaras? Were, they, were there examples in the past of being even larger? There are some slightly larger capybaras that are known. Actually, they capybaras used to live in the various parts of North America, um, mm -hmm. so along the, the Gulf Coast, and I think there's also some specimens from Arizona. But um, capybaras used to live a lot further north as well. Right. But some of them were were bigger in the past. All right. Well, we are at one hour, David. Is there are there any other uh, pressing questions that we should include? I think that uh, at, at one o'clock now, we can go ahead and wrap up. If there are more questions that pop up in the chat, uh, we'll make sure to, to look at those and see if we can get Josh to provide some answers for us later. All right. Well, thanks so much, Josh. This was really enlightening, I think, for everybody. Glad to come. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.